And the, the title of the sermon is, is kind of sobering. You can see right away, uh, we, we mentioned it last week. Paul, we, we talk a lot about Paul and Paul's letters. Um, Emily, there's, I think it's a little bit warm. Can you hit the fan switch right behind your head? All right. We talked about Paul's letters, and Paul is a theologian, so Paul often talks about theology, and then he gets to application, kind of the latter part of his letters. James, James is not primarily a theologian. As you read James, as you pick up his heart, James is first and foremost a pastor. Um, he was a pastor in Jerusalem. Uh, he was a brother of Jesus. That's the James we assume it is, and, and history tells us that it is. And he was the, the pastor in Jerusalem. And so you, you kind of see that pastor's heart. James is not, not primarily concerned with, let me lay down theology for you so that you can understand the truths and the, the theory. James jumps right in and says, let me talk about your lives. Let me talk about your, how you're doing life and how it lines up with truth. Um, he's called, James is probably as close as the New Testament gets to wisdom literature. So when you think about Old Testament wisdom literature, you have uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, not Song of Solomon, Proverbs, those, those books that give you a lot of true, a lot of practical ways to understand life. And James picks up a lot of that. James picks up a lot of Jesus' type of preaching, where Jesus would talk about, you know, a Sermon on the Mount. It's very practical. Jesus did talk a lot of theology. There was theology behind what he said. But what Jesus preached was, this is how you ought to live. This is how you ought to treat people. This is how you ought to view money. This is how you ought to view authorities. This is how you ought to view when someone wants to take your coat, give them your shirt as well. Someone slaps you on one side, turn the other side. You see what I'm saying? It's a lot of practical stuff. And James follows the pattern of his, of his half-brother, Jesus, and, and picks it up there. And we're going to look in verses 19 to 27 today. But, but this is the verse that, that kind of caught me. I mentioned last Sunday, um, he mentions in verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So he warns us that there's a deception in their lives about the good life we talked about last week. And this week, he comes back again to this deception. And, and again, that's the pastor heart of James. Do you, you see that? That James as a pastor has sheep, has people that he loves and he cares about. And his interaction with people has taught him that people are deceived, that people are deceived by lies and people are deceived by, by what the good life is that he addressed already. But now he kind of shifts his focus and says, don't be deceived, but, but don't just be deceived by lies and deception that's out there. Now look at how he, how he phrases it um, in verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Where's the deception coming from now? Come on, help me out. Where's the deception coming from? Inside the church and, and even more personal, inside ourselves. So in, earlier in verse 16, he says, don't be deceived by outside forces. People out there are going to try to lie to you. They're going to try to deceive you. And now he shifts it and says, it's not just people out there who are trying to deceive you. Your own heart will try to deceive you. Your own heart is going to tell you lies. You have to be careful not only of what you listen to, but also of what you let yourself believe and what you tell yourself. And, and this deception is, is centered around this. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. As a Christian, that ought to give us pause. We ought to stop and say, wow. James is saying that, that we can deceive ourselves to the extent that our whole religious practice, our whole religious experience is worthless. In other words, you being here at church today could be totally worthless spiritually. Let that sink in a little bit. Your religious experience, your religious beliefs, your, your religious confidence that I am okay with God because of dot, 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 dot. James is saying there are people who are deceiving themselves 
And what they think is making them okay with God is worthless before God. I'm, I'm doing a, a master's program on classical and Christian literature. And so right now we're in a course we're reading, just finished Dante's comedy. It, probably most people are familiar with Dante's Inferno, you know, where Dante kind of describes the nine layers of hell. And it's, it's fun reading, but very little from the Bible to go off of. Yes, Chris, it's fun. You should read it. It's, it's entertaining. Um, but there's two other sections. So there's the Inferno where he goes down to the ninth layer of hell. And then there's Purgatorio where he climbs Mount Purgatory. And I think some of you may know Catholic theology better. I think the Catholics have since 1600s when Dante wrote this, have since said that they no longer believe in purgatory. Does anybody know if that's true? I've been told that the Catholics don't believe in purgatory anymore. Um, and then there's Paradiso, which is the stars and the heavens. And he, he goes and eventually approaches and sees God himself. So at the end of reading it, one of my assignments was, what, what scene stuck out to you most? What scene struck you the most? And the scene that struck me was uh, about the seventh layer as they're getting, he's getting closer and closer to God. He sees St. Peter, or he sees Peter. Um, and of course, Dante was a Catholic, writing from a Catholic perspective. But it's interesting because you read, you read him. I'm sorry, I said 16th century. He wrote in the 1300s, before the Reformation. You read him, and so much of what he's writing is, is what the Reformers later will pick up and say, these are problems in the Catholic Church. He has several popes that he has stuck in hell, um, which is, for a Catholic, that's, that's bold writing. And then as he's going up into paradise, he, he sees Peter. And this is what Peter says in, in Canto 27. He says, he who on earth usurps that place of mine, that place of mine, that place of mine. So for the Catholics, what is the place of Peter? The head of the church, the, the bishop of Rome. He who on earth usurps that place of mine, which now stands vacant in the eyes of Christ, God's son, has turned my sepulcher into a sewer of blood and filth, at which the evil one who fell from here takes great delight down there. So Dante, a good Catholic, is saying the, the papacy is vacant. There is no pope. The one who usurps it fills it with a sewer of blood and filth at which the evil one who fell from here takes great delight down there. This isn't a, a tirade against the papacy. This is to say that, that Dante looks at the church of his time and says the only one who's excited about what's happening in Rome is Satan. Satan is the only one taking great delight. And, and of all the scenes in all the different uh, inferno, purgatory, and paradise, that struck me because as a pastor, I have to regularly ask myself, who is pleased about what we're doing at High Point? Who looks at High Point and says, that is good. That is what I want to happen. Is it God? Is it Christ? Or as Dante accuses the church of his time, is Satan looking and saying, I am excited about what's happening there. I am pleased about what's happening. And it's, it's not foreign from the Bible. Um, if you want, stick a finger in James and go to Isaiah chapter 1. If you're at High Point very long, you're probably going to hear me refer to this passage because it's a passage, again, as a pastor that, that haunts me that I have to think about, I have to, to wrestle with. Isaiah 1.12, God tells the prophet Isaiah to say to the church, the, the congregation, the people of his time, when you come to appear before me, as we have come today, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain, or in the words of James, what would it be? Worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. So in other words, in New Testament, we talk about our prayers being an incense, uh, being a, a sweet-smelling offering that goes up to God. And in, his, in Isaiah's time, he says, your incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates them. 
They've become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So, so God sends the prophet to the people saying, would you please stop praying to me? Would you please stop sacrificing to me? Would you please stop your church services? Because they're, they're burdensome to me to have to watch you, to have to endure it. Do you see why that's haunting for me as a pastor? Why when Dante, when Dante talks about Peter saying the only person pleased with the church is Satan, we as a church ought to pause and think, is our religion worthless or is it pure? How does God view our religion? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, it doesn't bother me that you judge me. It doesn't bother me what people think about me. There's one person that I'm concerned about my work as a, as a pastor or as a missionary, and that's Jesus Christ. Because everybody on the earth could say, good job, Paul, good job, Paul, good job, Paul. But if at the end, Jesus Christ says, all of your work is worthless and a waste, it all goes up in smoke. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, same thing that James is telling us here, we have to be careful. Is our religion worthless or is it pure? So we're going to try to think through with James. I think there's three questions we can ask ourselves. And three questions that will tell you before you leave, is your religion worthless? Is, is your time in church? Is your time in God's word? Is what you're doing spiritually worthless or worthwhile? Let's just pray before we get started. God, we sincerely love you. We sincerely want to be pleasing to you. But sincerity isn't enough. We need our sincerity to, to produce the right kinds of things, the right kinds of worship, the right kinds of of actions. We pray that it would. I pray that I would not speak Dwayne's words, I would not speak my opinions, but that you, through the writings of James, would speak to us this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Look up at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the Anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When it comes to religion, whatever, whatever way you're trying to get to God, this is the goal, this is the standard. Your, your efforts have to, and your, your system has to, in some way, produce the righteousness of God. You cannot know God, you cannot have fellowship with God, you cannot experience God without righteousness. So whatever, whatever approach to God we take has to have righteousness included. So if you could write down the first thing, pure religion, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I haven't even get started. We deceive ourselves when we mistake religious activity for righteousness. That's so what God is saying in Isaiah is you've got a lot of religious activity, but there's no righteousness. You're doing services, you're singing songs, you're offering prayers, you're, you're killing animals, but there's no righteousness. And without righteousness, all of that is empty. All of that is worthless and vain. Now James is picking it up and saying, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, and we as worshipers, we as people coming before God, have to find a way to find righteousness. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So the, the second thing there, pure religion begins with repentance and receiving the gospel of Jesus. There's a verse down in, uh, if you look down in verse 27, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So as you're reading this section, it seems like that's the golden nugget. In one verse, Paul says, or uh, James says, this is pure religion. This is what is pleasing. If you do this, God will be happy. And, and usually that's where our attention, where our eyes go to is, okay, 
All I, as long as I take care of widows and orphans and keep myself unstained from the world, that's what religion is all about. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. But it begins all the way back up in verse 21 where we get a, an approach to what pure religion looks like. You cannot do those things without righteousness, and the fact is that none of us are righteous. None of us ever can become righteous. So before you get about the, the work of trying to take care of orphans and widows and keeping yourself unstained from the world, you have to address the elephant in the room, which is that you must be righteous before God. And every single one of us is unrighteous before God. So, so pure religion begins all the way back in verse 21, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. You look at the message of John the Baptist, you look at the message of Jesus Christ, and, and what did their message always begin with? Repent. Everywhere they went, their message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, repent, repent. And, and sometimes we turn this into a, a big ordeal or a, a big process of what you have to do in order to meet the bar of repentance. I, I don't think it's that complicated. The, the concept is all of us are pursuing rampant wickedness and evil. In one way or another, it, we all have our different ways of pursuing wickedness. Some people do it in, in self-righteousness and pride, which on the level, on the outside, can look very good and moral, and yet it's still rampant wickedness. It's still filthy before God. Some people do it in, in outright depravity. And then everyone can see and say, oh, that person's a sinner and this person's a good person. But before God, all of us are unrighteous. And so we pursue that with our lives. And the idea of repentance is at some point you have to stop pursuing that and you have to turn and say, God, I want you. I want to pursue you. I want your salvation. I want your gift. A another picture is that we hold on to that, that, that our hands are grasping and gripping sin and rebellion and at some point, you have to give up that and grab hold of Jesus Christ. It's not that you have to work and impress God by, look how sorry I am, look at what I'll do to my body, or look at, I'll starve myself, or I'll fast, or I'll, you know, we don't have to impress God with our repentance. We don't have to show God, look how sorry I am. But at some point, you have to turn from wickedness and say, God, I'm turning away from that and I'm turning to you. God, I'm letting go of that, and I want to grab on to Jesus Christ. It says, put away filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. At some point, you have to receive the gospel. It says, the word which is able to save your souls. There is only one word which is able to save your soul. There's only one word that is able to take you and give you righteousness that you do not have of your own. It is the, the good news that Jesus Christ came to take your sins on himself and to give you what you don't have. To take your unrighteousness and to give you his righteousness. And that's as, that's as beautifully simple as it is. That we turn from our wickedness and we grasp on to Christ's righteousness. That is the word that is able to save your souls. So the very first question, if, if we're asking ourselves as a church, is our religion, is what we're doing worthless or worthwhile? Is it worthless or is it pure? It has to begin here because anything after this, if you've not taken this step, nothing else you do is worthwhile. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. It doesn't matter how many times you're baptized, how many ways you're baptized. You, you cannot be raised a Christian. We have membership forms, and on the membership form, we asked about your conversion experience, and we asked you to describe if you were before God and he asked you about letting you into his righteous heaven, how would you answer him? And, and we ask those intentionally because we want to know what are you putting your faith in? What are you counting on? And, our, and my heart breaks because sometimes as people are filling those out, the, the answer is, well, I have always been a Christian. My parents were Christian. I was raised a Christian. And I think theoretically I understand what people are saying is that I've always been raised as part of this Christian group. I've always been in the Christian denomination or the Christian faith. But you're not raised a Christian. 
You, you cannot be raised a Christian. At some point, you personally have to do this. So, so the question is, can you point to a time when you have repented and received the gospel of Jesus? Can you appoint to a time when you did this? Can you say, yes, I became a Christian. I converted from, from wickedness and from walking my own way to following Jesus Christ. Now, now certainly, faith is what saves us. And so faith grows and develops over time. Sometimes it's hard to say, this was the day that, that my faith grew to the point of salvation. I understand there's a process. There's... there's weeks, sometimes months, but physically, for our, for our own minds, it is, it is so helpful to pin down a time, say, this is the time that I'm going to turn, this is the time that I'm going to repent, and I'm going to receive the implanted word. Anything else that you do, if you haven't done that, is worthless. There's no church services, there's no catechisms, there's no baptisms, there's no mission trips you can take that mean anything if you haven't accepted Christ's righteousness. So this is the very first step. Is your religion worthless or pure? Can you point to a time when you have repented and received the implanted word? Next, he talks about <clears throat> the Christian life. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then we get that phrase again, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he was like. Do you hear James the pastor? See, Paul the theologian wants to get theology across to you. Paul wants you to understand mentally and make sure you have all the theological facts in a row. That's very important to Paul. James works with the same people year after year after year. And James says theology is important, theology is great, but if your theology doesn't change the way you live, then you can throw the theology out. It's not doing anything for you. It, it, do you see the different hearts? James the pastor says, I have talked to so many people who know all the theological answers, but their lives are, are worthless spiritually. And I'm tired of people telling me all, these, all this theology and not living it. So James's heart is burning for the people in the church who know, no, 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 talk, 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 think, 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 but never get around to what? never get around to doing what they know, what they talk about, what they think about. James the pastor says, please don't tell me another sermon on theology. Let me see it in your life. We'll get to that in just a second. But look at what he says now. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So the next thing I'd like you to fill out is pure religion listens to Christ's words. Now about this time, if you're thinking, if you're with me, and, and I hope you are, I hope you, you think about what I'm saying and look at God's word and say, is that what James is saying? I study all week to try to feed you God's word, but there's still a burden on you to say, okay, but I still have to see it for myself. I'm not just going to take your word for it. Just because Pastor Dwayne says this, is that what James is saying? And, and if, if you're thinking that way, hopefully by now I've said it's receiving the gospel of Jesus, and now I'm saying pure religion listens to Christ's word, and guess what name has never showed up in our reading so far? Dwayne, that's true. <laughs> Thank you, Mom, for humbling me. Absolutely. But I'm in good company because guess who else's name has never showed up in this passage yet? Are you, are, have you, are you thinking with me? Now I'm telling you he's pointing us to Jesus, but he has never used the word Jesus. So you ought to be thinking and say, okay, Dwayne, prove it. If, if you're saying James is pointing us to Christ, that sounds good, and I'm sure James wants us to look to Christ, but I don't see it in the passage. You have the right as a listener to ask those kinds of questions. Right? Shake your heads. 
When you listen to a sermon, ask the pastor questions, not verbally. That has happened before, and that makes the sermon interesting. But in your own head, you need to be asking questions. Okay, I hear your point, and it's a fine point, but is it in this passage? Is it in the text? So let me show you where I absolutely believe it's in the text. Verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law. If you were here last week, we talked about this word perfect. It it comes up two other times in this chapter. Back in verse 4, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, right? And then uh, when it talks about the Father giving good gifts, where's that? Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. Both times, perfect Uh, that you may be perfect, and then the Father gives perfect gifts. What did we say last week? What was that word? Does anybody remember the Greek word? Bonus points? Tell us. Yes, Seattle. That is awesome. Proud papa moment. The tell us. The goal. Goal, the end, the destination. So he says that you may be perfect, meaning that you may reach your goal, that you may reach your destination. And he says the Father gives perfect gifts. The Father gives complete gifts. The Father gives gifts that take you to the end and to the destination. And now he says you look into the perfect law. Guess, just take a wild guess what word that is. To tell us that you look into the completed law. Now completed law ought to start firing triggers in your head. That you look into the fulfilled law. That ought to fire triggers in your head. What did Jesus Christ say about himself in Matthew 5? I think that's the next verse that's going to come up. Christ is the fulfillment of the law, and his words set us free. So when James says, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty... Matthew 5 ought to come into your mind. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Complete them. Finish them. I've come to bring the law to its destination. I am the the end of the law. I am the telos of the law. Paul says exactly that in Romans. Romans 10 verse 4. Can you switch to that one, Avery? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. Romans 10, 4. And then John 8, 31. And 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth And the truth, which, how has he defined the truth? What is the truth, according to this verse? His word. If you abide in my words, you you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So James says, look into the complete law. Look into the perfected, finished law, the law of liberty. And, And I believe it's pointing us to Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ. Over and over and over, Christ told his disciples, listen to my words, hear my words, keep my words. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. Paul, it it went by quickly, but in Romans, Paul says, Jesus Christ is the telos of the law. He's the destination, the end, the goal of the law. So after we receive and repent, then the question is, are we listening to Jesus Christ? Do we listen to the words of Jesus Christ? This, this as a pastor, I'm going to step on toes a little bit, because this is one of my pet peeves. You're, you're talking to someone, and, and you open up God's word, and you say, this is what the Bible says, and then they reply, yeah, but my God wouldn't do that. My my faith doesn't include that. That's not the way I believe it will happen. So, so can you write this down? Are your religious beliefs from your own mind or from humbly listening to Jesus Christ? Back to Dante real quick. One of the, one of the kind of comical scenes is Dante is going through inferno, through hell. 
and he sees a mentor of his. He sees someone who has taught him, and, and he's so sad to see his mentor in hell, and he, you know, he's, he's heartbroken, and he loves this man, and the man, as he's walking away from his mentor, the man says, don't forget my teachings. Don't forget what I've told you. And the comical thing is, where have his teachings gotten him? His teachings have gotten him to hell, but even from hell, he's telling Dante, don't forget how I led you. Don't forget what I've told you. And it comes to mind when people have this theology of, well, my God wouldn't do this, and my faith doesn't say this, and my beliefs don't allow that. If it's your beliefs, they're worthless. Uh, our opinions and our thoughts of this is the way I want God to be and this is what I think God should do and this is what makes sense to me and my God would never do this and my God would never say that. Unfortunately, when I say that and when you say that, what we're saying is my God is different from the real God, the true God who has revealed himself. And that's worthless. You're, you're the guy in hell saying, hey, make sure to pay attention to what I believe, to what I taught. What you taught didn't get you anywhere. It will not get you anywhere. Your own faith that you make up, that you, that you develop in your own mind, can never save you. We need something outside of ourselves. If, if we could do it on our own, then we wouldn't need God at all. We could just think up our own religion to save ourselves. But the whole point of repentance and receiving is saying, I don't have the answer in myself. I don't have the answer in my own mind. I can't think up the solution. I need a solution outside of myself. I accept with meekness the implanted word. So I intentionally said, are your beliefs coming from your own mind or from humbly listening to Jesus Christ? We, we throw the word disciple around a lot. Disciple means student. Disciple means learner. In order to learn, you have to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Boy, should that talk to us as Americans. Germans in the room, just you know, hang out for a second. We Americans are quick to speak and slow to listen, aren't we? Can we not look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we like to talk. We like to talk loud. We want people to know what we think, we want people to know what we're excited about. We want people to know what we're upset about. It's our right as Americans to express our opinions. And, and James is challenging us to say, be quick to listen. Be quick to shut our mouths and open our ears. And that requires humility. This is one of James, as a pastor, this is one of James' hobby horses is humility. He's going to come back to it. Humble yourselves. Close your mouths, open your ears, let your theology come from God instead of telling God your theology and forcing him to play along with it. So can you point to a time when you repented and received? That's the first question. If not, nothing else you do is worthwhile. Are your religious beliefs from your own mind or from humbly listening to Jesus Christ? Once you've believed and accepted, then you've got to build a theology, build beliefs that come from Scripture, that come from truth, and not tell God what he is or is not to do. But then all of those are, are secondary to, Paul, uh, to James's emphasis. James burning in James's heart is you've got to do what you listen to. You've got to do what you hear. You've got to be a doer and not just to hear. And so he gets to 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. How did Jesus Christ sum up the law? Love. Two different principles. Love what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind from the Old Testament. What's the other principle he picked up? Love your neighbor as yourself. So when he says, look at the perfect law, the completed law, he's not saying make sure you, know, you don't mix, mix, won't wear mixed fabrics, make sure you don't trim your beard. That's not the completed law. The completed law, Jesus Christ 
embodies for us, delivers to us in his own righteousness, and teaches us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But again, James the pastor is not willing. So many churches and so many Christians, if you say, what's the, what's the epitome of the Christian life? Love God and love people. How many people have heard that before? Come on, just help me out. Patronize me. Thank you. Love God and love people. That's, that's it. And it's true. It's perfectly true. But James isn't willing to leave it at platitudes because if we say love God and love people, then I choose what my love for God looks like and I choose who I love. So, so if I leave you as a pastor with love God and love people, how many of you are going to go out and say, man, I really don't love God? It's true. I can tell by the way I'm living. I don't love God. Or I really don't love people. Some of us look in the mirror and are honest enough with ourselves, but James the pastor knows our hearts. James the pastor knows that most of us will convince ourselves that we love God and that we love people. We're doing okay. So James doesn't say love God and love people. Do you, you see what he's doing? He drills down deeper and he says, I'm not gonna, and, and I even had typed in my notes at the bottom, do you love God and do you love people? Because I think that's the core of what James is getting at. That's the completed law. But then I thought, Everyone's going to say yes to that. We tell ourselves that we do. So James says, it's not, not just generalities of love God and love people. Are you unstained from the world? Do you love God enough to say no to other things? See, all of us would say we love God. But James says, if you're staining yourself in the world then your life is saying that you don't love God. You are an adulterer. You're an adulteress. You're married to God, and you're flirting and, and committing immorality with the world. Are you unstained from the world? Don't tell me you love God. Tell me whether you're unstained from the world or not. And then he gets to people and says, don't tell me you love people. Tell me what you're doing for the afflicted. Tell me what you're doing for the people who are, who are trodden down by everyone else. Don't talk to me. Don't tell me about your beliefs. Don't tell me about your theology. Just tell me what you're doing for the orphans and the widows. That's what I want to know. I want to see your theology play itself out. I want to see your life. And it's not just warm in here, but then you start to sweat a little bit because James doesn't let us off the hook with, I love God and I love people. James says, do you love orphans and widows? Are you caring for them? Are you keeping yourself only for God? That's what I want to know. That's what pure religion looks like. Let's pray together. Mm -hmm.